Book One, Chapter Two, Part Three. Out the window, far below, I could see a large city. Judging from our flight path, I suspected it was Orlando, Florida. I was struck by the geometric outline of the streets and avenues, the planned and ordered configuration of what humans had built. I looked over at Dobson. His eyes were closed, and he appeared to be asleep. For an hour, he had told me more about the second insight. Then our lunch had arrived, and we had eaten, and I had told him about Charlene and why I had decided to come to Peru. Afterward, I wanted only to gaze out at the cloud formations and consider what he had said. So, what do you think? He asked suddenly, looking sleepily over at me. Have you grasped the second insight? I'm not sure. He nodded towards the other passengers. Do you feel as if you have a clearer perspective on the human world? Do you see how preoccupied everyone has been? This perspective explains a lot. How many people do you know who were obsessed with their work, who are type A or have stress-related diseases and who can't slow down? They can't slow down because they use their routine to distract themselves, to reduce life to only its practical considerations, and they do this to avoid recalling how uncertain they are about why they live. The second insight extends our consciousness of historical time. It shows us how to observe culture, not just from the perspective of our own lifetimes, but from the perspective of a whole millennium. It reveals our preoccupation to us and so lifts us above it. You have just experienced this longer history. You now live in a longer now. When you look at the human world, you should be able to clearly see this obsessiveness, this intense preoccupation with the economic progress. But what's wrong with that? It's what made Western civilization great. <laughs> of course you're right. No one's saying it was wrong. In fact, the manuscript says the preoccupation was a necessary development, a stage in human evolution. Now, however, we've spent enough time settling into the world. It's time to wake up from the preoccupation and reconsider our original question. What's behind life on this planet? Why are we really here? I looked at him for a long time, then asked, Do you think the other insights explain this purpose? Dobson cocked his head. I think it's worth a look. I just hope no one destroys the rest of the manuscript before we have a chance to find out. How could the Peruvian government think they could destroy an important artifact like that and get away with it? They would do it covertly. The official line is that the manuscript doesn't exist at all. I would think the scientific community would be all up in arms. He looked at me with an expressive resolve. We are. That's why I'm returning to Peru. I represent ten prominent scientists, all of whom demand that the original manuscript be made public. I sent a letter to the relevant department heads within the Peruvian government, telling them that I was coming and that I expected cooperation. I see. I wonder how they will respond. Probably with denials, but at least it will be an official start. He turned away deep in thought, and I stared out the window again. As I looked down, it dawned on me that the airplane on which we were riding contained within its technology four centuries of progress. We had learned much about manipulating the resources we had found on Earth. How many people, I mused, how many generations did it take to create the products and the understanding that enabled this airplane to come into being? And how many spent their whole lives focused on one tiny aspect? one small step, without ever lifting their heads from that preoccupation. Suddenly, in that instant, the span of history Dobson and I had been discussing seemed to integrate fully into my consciousness. I could see the millennium clearly, as though it was part of my own life history. A thousand years ago, we had lived in the world where gods and human spirituality were clearly defined, and then we had lost it or rather, we had decided there was more to the story. Accordingly, we had sent explorers out to discover the real truth and report back, and when they had taken too long, we had become preoccupied with a new, secular purpose, one of settling into the world and making ourselves more comfortable. And settle we had. We discovered the metallic ores could be melted down and fashioned into all kinds of gadgets. We invented sources of power, first steam, then gas, then electricity and fusion. We systemized farming and mass production, 
and now commanded huge stores of material goods and vast networks of distribution. Propelling it all was the call to progress, the desire of the individual to provide his own security, his own purpose while he was waiting for the truth. We had decided to create a more comfortable and pleasurable life for ourselves and our children, and in a mere 400 years, our preoccupation had created a human world where all the comforts of life could now be produced. The problem was that our focused, obsessive drive to conquer nature and make ourselves more comfortable had left natural systems on the planet polluted and on the verge of collapse. We couldn't go on this way. Dobson was right. A second insight did make our new awareness seem inevitable. We were reaching a climax in our cultural purpose. We were accomplishing what we had collectively decided to do, and as this happened, our preoccupation was breaking down and we were waking up to something else. I could almost see the momentum of the modern age slowing as we approached the end of the millennium. The 400 year obsession had been completed. We had created the means of material security and now we seemed to be ready, poised in fact, to find out why we had done it. In the faces of the passengers around me, I could see evidence of preoccupation but I also thought I detected brief glimpses of awareness. How many, I wondered, had already noticed the coincidences? The plane tilted forward and began its descent as the flight attendant announced that we would be soon landing in Lima. I gave Dobson the name of my hotel and asked where he was staying. He gave me the name of his hotel and said it was only a couple miles away from mine. What's your plan? I asked. I've been thinking about that. The first thing, I guess, is to visit the American Embassy and tell them why we're here, just for the record. Good idea. After that, I'm going to speak with as many Peruvian scientists as I can. The scientists at the University of Lima have already told me that they have no knowledge of the manuscript, but there are other scientists who are working at various ruins who may be willing to talk. What about you? What are your plans? I have none. Do you mind if I tangle on? Not at all. I was going to suggest it. 